Hi, this is Dr. Perry Carpenter. I'd like to thank you for taking the time to join me on today's program. On today's program, we're beginning a brand new series entitled The QME Forensic Super Sleuth. Super Sleuth. Super Sleuth. <laughs> and let me ask you, as a qualified medical evaluator, have you ever at times felt like you were required to be a super sleuth in order to uh, do the work that you do? Have you ever felt like you uh, needed to be a bit of a private investigator or a special agent in order to be able to understand and determine the facts of the case in order to come out at the end of the case to provide opinions and conclusions that are uh, somewhat in the realm of reality? Have you ever felt that if you had more information that you could possibly do a much, much better job and in the absence of such information, you're required to uh, be a little bit like Detective Columbo in determining the information that is necessary for you to do your job, but the information that the parties, for whatever reason, uh, neglect or omit to provide you. Have you ever felt this way? Have you ever felt like as part of being a qualified medical evaluator, it's required or incumbent upon you? to be a bit of a super sleuth? <laughs> Let me ask you, have you ever felt that way? Well, the reason that you have felt that way or you may have felt that way in the past is because it's true. It's true. So many times as qualified medical evaluators, we go into the face-to-face -face evaluation or we go into a deposition and we don't have all of the facts, which if we had more of the facts, if we had all of the facts, we could certainly do a much better job in providing our finished final product, which is our QME report, which would therefore be an accurate representation, number one, of the examinee's true condition, and then also would be an accurate representation of the true and accurate facts regarding the examinee's particular case. But for whatever reason, either by commission or omission, many times we don't have the adequate facts that we could, should, or would have prior to going into these gray area situations, such as the face-to-face -face evaluation and such as a deposition. So the purpose of this program is to help you determine the information that you need, the information that you require to determine the information that's essential for you to come up with opinions and conclusions that are accurate. And this involves coming up with information uh, from the parties and determining the uh, issues surrounding the case that many times are not provided to you in advance. Number two, in working with the examinee uh, and determining the examinee's true condition and the examinee's true physical examination findings and the examinee's true, if any, limitations to activities of daily living. And then also in part three of this program, I wanna to talk to you about the information that uh, will help serve you when you go into deposition, where certainly neither of the parties deposing you uh, want you to be privy to the information in advance that they withhold from you in order to orchestrate the deposition uh, to their own best interests. So the purpose of this program is to help you unearth and to determine uh, necessary information that will help you come out smelling like a rose in the face-to-face -face evaluation, in producing your QME report, and should the circumstances require it, help you come out smelling like a rose in deposition. And in part one of uh, today's program, I want to talk to you about the information that you as a qualified medical evaluator are going to need to discover in carrying out your face-to-face -face evaluation with the examinee. And that has to do with determining the actual scope of the evaluation. If you can determine the scope of the evaluation in advance, of the actual evaluation itself, the scope of the evaluation will then drive the direction that you take in the face-to-face -face interview and then also in the face-to-face -face physical examination 
with the examinee. And many times the parties, they do not share with us this information in advance. And so we're left going into the face-to-face -face evaluation with the examinee blinded and lacking information, which if we had, <laughs> if we actually had the information, we could certainly do a much, much better job. So with that as our introduction, let's begin uh, part one of uh, this program and talk today about how the QME Forensic Super Sleuth determines the scope of the evaluation. Okay, so in determining the scope of the QME evaluation, it's important for you as a qualified medical evaluator to remember two things. Number one is that in every qualified medical evaluation, you're going to be dealing with a small and finite group of players, also known as the parties. Now, number two, each of the parties involved with your evaluation are going to uh, come to the evaluation and are going to expect out of the evaluation that certain of their needs are going to be met. So part of being a QME forensic super sleuth is to determine the needs of each of the parties and players based upon where the claim is in its particular life cycle. In other words, the scope of the evaluation and the stage at which the claim exists within its life cycle is going to demand and command a different set of needs from each of the parties. So in every qualified medical evaluation, we're going to be dealing with what we refer to as the parties. The parties include the claims administrator. The parties include any attorneys involved in the case, such as the applicant attorney or the defense attorney and then also uh, the examinee is one of the parties. And then beyond those immediate parties, there's also going to be secondary parties, such as workers' compensation judges, and perhaps even raters down at the disability evaluation unit. So coming into the evaluation, you as the qualified medical evaluator, super sleuth, needs to have some understanding of the basic needs of the parties depending upon where the claim is in its particular life cycle. Then in the face-to-face -face examination, we're going to be dealing with a, a finite and a small group of examinees, examinees. And examinees have their own set of needs and their own set of expectations as they proceed through the evaluation, depending upon where the evaluation falls within the life cycle of the claim. And as you, you as the QME forensic super sleuth need to have a basic understanding of the needs of the examinee at each of the stages of the claim as it progresses from the inception of the claim to the conclusion of the claim. And then finally, should the case come to a deposition and should you be called by one or more of the parties to a deposition, it's important for you as the QME forensic super sleuth to go into the deposition with a good understanding as to the needs of the attorneys who are present with you uh, in deposition. If you can understand what are the motivating and driving needs of the parties and the attorneys that bring you to deposition, you can certainly do a much, much better job uh, at deposition and come out of that deposition uh, with your head held high knowing that indeed uh, you represented yourself uh, professionally and accurately. So it's critical that we understand what we refer to as each of the parties agenda. Each of the parties bring to the qualified medical evaluation their own agenda. And therefore, based upon the agenda of each of the parties, each of the parties look to us as qualified medical evaluators to satisfy their agenda and to satisfy their needs. And the needs and the agendas vary and differ based upon wherein the claim exists along its spectrum of its life cycle. And we're going to talk about the entire spectrum of the life cycle of the claim. And we're going to talk about each of the agendas and the needs of the parties as the claim progresses throughout its life cycle. Okay, so now let's talk about determining the scope of the evaluation based upon where the evaluation 
uh, is called for along the spectrum of the claim's life cycle. So when we consider the life cycle of a claim, the life cycle of the claim spans the spectrum from the date at which the claim form is filed, this is the inception of the claim, all the way through the treatment phase of the claim, all the way to the conclusion of the claim when the claim is either, the case is either closed or the case is settled by either compromise and release and or a permanent disability award. And a qualified medical evaluation can arise at any point along the entire spectrum uh, of the life cycle of the claim. So let's talk about uh, these various phases wherein the qualified medical evaluation occurs. And this is called determining the scope of the qualified medical evaluation. Okay, so this whole idea of being a QME forensic super sleuth has to do with determining and discovering the information that none of the parties have been kind enough to tell us. <laughs> so, for example, if the claims administrator in their cover letters would just tell us uh, the circumstances surrounding the claim and the disputes that bring the claim to us as a qualified medical evaluator, we could certainly do a much, much better job in the evaluation. If examinees would just tell us what their situation is and tell us what their limitations with activities of daily living are and tell us uh, what their physical examination uh, findings truly and accurately are, we could do a much better job. If we could determine in advance to going into a deposition, what are the questions that the attorneys plan on asking us rather than being surprised at the deposition, right? If we could just determine and discover what they don't tell us, if we could figure out what it is that they're not telling us, we could certainly do a much better job. And that's where it's required that we be super sleuth forensic investigators as qualified medical evaluators in discovering this information. And then beyond the point at which you discover the information in the future, if you can anticipate this information, you can anticipate the needs and the agendas of the parties based upon the wherein the life cycle of the claim, the qualified medical evaluation comes, comes up, you could certainly do a much, much better job knowing that you have all the facts upon which to provide your opinions and conclusions. So in determining the scope of the evaluation, what they don't tell us in cover letters is they don't tell us uh, many times exactly that. They don't tell us what is the scope of the evaluation. They don't tell us what is the issue and dispute that brings up the need for a qualified medical evaluation. So as the QME forensic super sleuth, it's incumbent upon you in these cases to determine what is the dispute and therefore what is the scope of the evaluation. You should think about this in advance of every single evaluation that you do. And I'll share with you some ideas as to help you discover this critical information. So in terms of the scope of the evaluation and the direction that you take within the evaluation, the scope of the evaluation is determined and dictated uh, by three laws, three labor codes, labor codes 4060, labor code 4061, and labor code 4062. And we're gonna get into these labor codes in detail here in just a minute. But the operative principle here in being a QME super sleuth is to ask yourself prior to every face-to-face -face evaluation, which labor code is driving the need for this evaluation? That's the key question you want to ask yourself because each of these labor codes provide for the resolution of different disputed issues. So if you can determine the labor code that uh, created the need for the evaluation, that will tell you in advance what are the needs of the parties uh, uh, in the evaluation and it will tell you the direction for you to take uh, within the evaluation itself. So always ask yourself prior to every face-to-face -face evaluation with the examinee, under which labor code was this particular examination ordered, okay? 
And so let's go over these uh, labor codes now one at a time. Okay, so in order to understand how these labor codes, labor codes 4060, 4061, and 4062, how they play into the need for a qualified medical evaluation, let's just imagine the following scenario. Let's say you're an employee of a company and you claim an industrial injury. You make a claim that an injury to your physical person body has occurred uh, in the course of uh, your employment and arising out of your employment with your company. Well, a dispute can arise among any of the parties, including yourself, at anywhere along the life cycle of the claim. A dispute can arise at the inception of the claim, at the point in time at which the claim is filed, and that dispute is driven by one specific labor code. A dispute can arise in the middle of the claim. For example, somewhere along the middle of the claim, uh, a dispute arises as to your need for uh, either ongoing or some particular form of medical treatment. Or perhaps a dispute can arise as to uh, a new injury, perhaps a compensable consequence injury. Or perhaps there was a, a body part that was uh, originally injured in the original incident that up till now has not uh, been acknowledged or has not received any medical treatment and a dispute can arise as to what are the uh, body parts that are actually involved in the industrial injury. So that would be an example of a dispute that could arise along the midpoint of the claim. And then uh, as the claim uh, nears its conclusion, disputes can arise as to the extent uh, of any permanent impairment, can exist as to even the actual existence of any permanent impairment. Uh, disputes can arise over uh, any apportionment of the permanent impairment. Disputes can arise as to the need for uh, permanent work modifications or permanent work restrictions. And so disputes can arise anywhere along the life cycle of the claim. And depending upon where the dispute arises in the life cycle of the claim, determines which labor code governs the QME evaluation. So I want you to imagine that uh, you're an injured employee and a dispute has arisen. Well, in order to order a resolution of the dispute through a qualified medical evaluation, you're going to have to request a qualified medical evaluation from the Division of Workers' Compensation Medical Unit. And if you're an unrepresented injured worker, you will do this yourself or perhaps the claims administrator will initiate the process if the claims administrator is the person uh, claiming a dispute. Or if you're a represented injured worker, this will likely be done, be done for you by your applicant attorney. In any, in any event, for unrepresented injured workers, the process begins with the completion of QME Form 105, or for represented injured workers with QME Form 106. And in most circumstances, uh, for the more recent dates of injury, this is done through the completion of the, these forms uh, online. So in order to understand the scope of the evaluation and which labor code is driving the evaluation, let's take a look uh, at each of these forms sequentially. Okay, so here we have QME Form 105, and this is the form that is going to be used for unrepresented injured workers. And this form can be filled out by either of the uh, injured worker themselves or it can also be filled out by the claims administrator. So let's understand this form and let's uh, go through the instructions on this form together. It says to request a qualified medical evaluator panel certain steps are required. Number one is to complete this form. Number two, and this is important, it says if the request for a qualified medical evaluator panel is made to determine if the injury is work related. In other words, in this case, the dispute is to whether or not the injury is work related. This is a dispute at the inception of the claim, correct? If the request is made to determine if the injury is work related, then along with this form, the requesting party must include a copy of the claims administrator's notice that the claim was denied. That's what is to be included when this form is completed by the employee or when the form is 
uh, completed by the claims administrator also must be included a copy of the claims administrator's request for an evaluation. So imagine that you're an employee and you're claiming an industrial injury and a dispute arises and the claims administrator denies your claim. You would then, as an injured worker, you would include a copy of the claims administrator's notice that the claim was denied and that would suffice uh, 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 for a need for the qualified medical evaluation, okay? Now, notice here on the form, after the demographic information, such as date of injury, claim number, down here it asks for you to complete the reason for the need for the QME panel and the subsequent panel evaluation. And box number one has to do with those claims that are the denied claims, the claims where the dispute has arisen as to whether or not the injury is work-related. So the instruction is the same as the one we just, uh, as we just reviewed. You check this box if the dispute is to resolve the issue as to whether or not the injury is work-related. So that's one classification of dispute. Now, later on in the life cycle of the claim, there could be a dispute related to the primary physician's determination regarding either temporary disability, permanent disability, or the need for future medical care. If the dispute was one of those three things, then you would check this box right here. Or perhaps a dispute could arise as to uh, what are the involved body parts uh, involved with the industrial injury, in which case the box would be checked here. And if there was some other need, some other non-medical treatment dispute, something outside the realm of medical treatment, the party would provide a little bit of additional information here in this line and would check the appropriate box here. And all of these determinations are governed by a certain labor code. And on this particular form, because this particular form uh, is many times handled by lay persons unrepresented employees, the uh, drivers of the need for the qualified medical evaluation are spelled out in lay person's terms rather than through the use of the labor codes because injured workers have no knowledge of labor codes. So here on QME Form 105, the reasons for the panel QME request are spelled out in lay language. Now we're gonna see that this is a little bit different for those cases that involve represented injured workers where the request for a QME panel is carried out through the use of QME Form 106. Here's QME Form 106, and again, QME Form 106 is to be used for those uh, employees who are represented by an attorney. And in most cases, uh, in fact, probably in 100% of cases, this form is gonna be completed by uh, one or the other of the attorneys involved with the case. And because the attorneys are involved with completing this form, then the need for the evaluation, the need for the qualified medical evaluation is described not in lay language as it is in QME Form 105, but it's described by the labor code which drives the evaluation. So notice that the requesting party, whether that be the applicant attorney or whether that be the claims administrator or the defense attorney, are gonna check the box here for the dispute involved that's driving the need for the evaluation. So if the dispute is over whether or not the injury was, is work-related, that dispute is resolved under Labor Code 4060, the party would then check this box. <clears throat> if the dispute has to do with a temporary disability dispute, a permanent disability dispute, the types of uh, body parts involved with the industrial injury, then those disputes are resolved under Labor Code 4061. And then for non-medical treatment disputes, those are resolved under Labor Code 4062. The requesting party would then check this box. And this is the form 
that's to be used for injuries occurring prior to January 1, 2005. Now, this is almost 15 years ago. So this form is not going to see a whole lot of use in this day and age. For injuries after 1105, this form must be completed online. And we'll take a look at that form in just a minute. But what the take home message uh, that these forms teach us is that the need for a qualified medical evaluation is governed under a finite uh, set of labor codes. There's three labor codes that drive and govern the qualified medical evaluation. Labor code 4060 is to determine the compensability of the claim. 4061 is to resolve disputes over temporary disability, permanent disability, and or body parts involved. And then 4062 is sort of the catch-all labor code that handles other issues not covered by labor codes 4061 and 4060. So as a QME forensic sleuth, you want to always, always ask yourself, under which labor code is this evaluation being requested? If you can determine which labor code is driving the need for the evaluation, that then determines the scope and direction of the evaluation and it dictates the all of the procedures uh, in your interview, all of the questioning that you employ in your interview. It determines all of the physical examination maneuvers that you employ in the physical examination. And it tells you uh, what issue is in dispute and therefore uh, helps you to better be able to resolve the disputed issue because you know in advance what is the issue that's driving the evaluation, okay? So we'll go over these labor codes in just a minute, but let's just take a quick look now at the online version of this particular form. Okay, and then finally, here is the online version of the form to be used uh, for all panel requests for dates of injury after 1105, okay? So uh, this is the online version of QME form 106. Again, it asks for all the basic information, such as the demographics, the claim number, the date of injury. But notice down here, it asks the attorneys to tell us which of the labor codes is driving the need for the evaluation. And you'll notice when you select the labor code, the different types of, types of dispute come up in the drop-down menus. So for example, labor code 4060, that's the labor code that derives the, what's so-called the compensability dispute, the determination as to whether the injury is work-related or not is governed under Labor Code 4060. Labor Code 4061, as we talked about earlier, deals with disputes, wait for this to load, deals with disputes over temporary disability, uh, the existence or the extent of permanent disability, or the extent or the need of future medical treatment, etc. And then Labor Code 4062 is sort of the catch-all labor code that deals with other various issues unrelated to medical treatment. So the party that requests, is requesting the QME panel has to indicate to the Division of Workers' Compensation which labor code is driving the need for the evaluation. And as, if we as qualified medical evaluators were told this in advance, we would better understand the scope of the evaluation. So the take home message for you as a QME forensic super sleuth is to always ask yourself, okay, what is the labor code that's governing the need for the evaluation? And notice labor code 4060, this deals with the compensability dispute, whether or not the injury is work related or not. So when do you think this labor code is operative in the life cycle of the claim? This labor code is operative in the early phases, the inception phases, the initiation phases of the claim. That's when claims over compensability arise. They arise at the inception of the claim. claim uh, disputes over the existence of permanent disability do not arise at the beginning of claims, those types of disputes, 
those arise at the end of the claim. Okay? Disputes over permanent and stationary status, that's the type of dispute that would arise somewhere along the midpoint of the claim. <coughs> A dispute over the diagnosis would arise somewhere along the midpoint of the claim. So if you can determine which labor code is driving the evaluation, you can determine what is the disputed issue. Similarly, if you know what the disputed issue is, that tells you also where in the claim is within its life cycle, and that also tells you which labor code is driving the need for the evaluation. So this is information that the parties don't tell us in advance, which if we knew, if we knew, if we were privy to this inside information, in other words, if we received a, a copy of uh, QME Form 105 or 106 along with the medical records, we would better understand what is the disputes and therefore what is uh, our role and therefore what are the needs uh, and the agendas of the parties, okay? So let's talk now a little bit more about each of these labor codes. So now that we know about these labor codes, labor code 4060, 4061, and 4062, let's take a look now at how each of these labor codes shapes and determines the scope of your evaluation. And because each of these labor codes deal with different issues in dispute, each of these labor codes is going to require a different approach in your face-to-face -face evaluation with the injured worker. Now the best way to determine the scope of the practice and the best way to determine which of these labor codes is driving the need for your evaluation is to simply request that the party send to you a copy of QME Form 106. QME Form 106 is the form that the parties use to order the QME panel upon which your name appears. So the parties have this form and the parties, even though they're not accustomed to providing this form to us as qualified medical evaluators, the parties will provide this form to you if you'll simply ask for the form. Now, if you're unable to get the form for whatever reason, maybe the parties uh, neglect to send you this form, or if they refuse to send you this form, you can still determine the scope of your evaluation, and you can still determine which labor code is driving the need for your evaluation through a careful analysis of the cover letters that you get. So let's now take a look at a couple of sample cover letters to see if we can determine in QME forensic super sleuth fashion to see if we can determine what is the labor code uh, driving the need for the evaluation and therefore if we know which labor code is driving the need for the evaluation how that shapes and determines the procedures that we employ in our interview of the examinee and in our physical examination procedures with the examinee and if we can determine these things we can streamline, streamline, streamline the evaluation down to the issues that are absolutely vital, necessary, and critical that we handle and resolve and we can disregard everything and anything else not related to the issue in dispute. Now with regards to cover letters, we're going to take a look at a couple sample letters to see if we can determine the labor code that's driving the need for the evaluation. We're going to see if we can determine through an understanding of that labor code, see if we can determine what is the issue in dispute, see if we can determine which of the body parts are the body parts that are going to be relevant to our physical examination, and therefore knowing the labor code, knowing the issue in dispute, and knowing the body parts that are involved how can we fashion and format our physical examination procedures so that we handle the issue in dispute completely and accurately and in its totality, but we restrict uh, our attention from physical examination procedures that are not necessary, that are simply time wasters, that are simply superfluous and are not relevant to the resolution of the disputed issue. This will uh, dramatically help you to streamline your uh, evaluation procedure first and foremost and your physical examination procedure secondarily. 
so that you can quickly and accurately conclude these evaluations in the most time efficient manner possible. Okay, so to illustrate these principles, uh, let's take a look at a couple of recent actual uh, and sample cover letter. Okay, so here we have a sample attorney attorney cover letter, and this is a cover letter that could come to you from either the applicant attorney or the defense attorney. And I'm sure you'll agree with me that when you receive a cover letter from one or more of the parties, the portion of the cover letter that's customized to your specific examinee varies. That variation can vary uh, from one end of the extreme to, you know, absolutely no customization with no specific details regarding your examinee. And I have examples of those cover letters in my, uh, in my library, all the way to much more detailed cover letters that do a fabulous job on giving you some background information regarding the examinee. So the amount of customized detail that we get varies. And it's up to us to determine within that limited information, what is the labor code that's driving the need for the evaluation? What is the issue in dispute? What are the body parts involved in the evaluation? And therefore, we can determine how to fashion our face-to-face -face evaluation in order to be focused, targeted, and direct uh, in resolving the disputed issue. So let's see if we can determine some of those issues uh, from this actual attorney cover letter. So it starts out, it gives us the demographic uh, information here. It says, thank you for agreeing to examine the injured worker. And this is all generic text. Now we get down here into some facts and it tells us that the applicant is a landscaper. He's alleged a specific injury to his left shoulder while lifting heavy rocks during employment on 8-13-2021. Now, does this paragraph, this one sentence paragraph, give us any relevant facts that will help us to determine the scope of the evaluation? I think it does. I think it does. And some of the key uh, details within this paragraph are number one, the use of the word alleged, alleged. Okay, so that perhaps suggests that this is a claim that has been submitted, but perhaps has not yet been accepted. The use of the word alleged tells us that they're alleging a specific injury versus a cumulative trauma injury that may be relevant to us as well. In other words, we're going to be looking uh, for a distinct injury condition in the left shoulder. So the body parts involved with this evaluation is the left shoulder while lifting heavy rocks during employment on 8-13-2021. So this tells us that this is a relatively recent date of injury. With this, this recording is being made in January 2022. So this is a, an injury only a few months ago. And it's a lifting injury. So what does that tell us about the potential universe of injurious conditions or diagnoses that could be involved with the left shoulder. In other words, this is not a fracture injury. This is not a crush injury. The range of injuries that this examinee could present to us in the face-to-face -face examination with is relatively bracketed by a small number of lifting type injuries that could involve the shoulder. Continuing on, it tells us that the applicant became represented and his attorney has alleged, again, the use of the word alleged, injuries to the same body parts, which is the left shoulder. And then here is a key paragraph. They tell us that a timely denial of benefits was issued by defendants. So this is a denied claim. This is not an accepted claim. And boom, ding, 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 ding. We now know that this is very likely, this is likely an evaluation that's ordered under Labor Code 4060 as the compensability evaluation. The issue in dispute in this evaluation is AOE, COE, industrial causation. It's not a dispute that involves permanent disability. It's not a dispute that involves apportionment. It's not a dispute that involves the need for future medical care. This is going to be a compensability evaluation under Labor Code 4060. And we can get that 
we can get that or get very close to that with just the limited facts that we've gleaned from this uh, sample cover letter. It says that the reason for the denial was that there was no medical evidence to support the alleged injuries claimed. An applicant did not notify the employer of his claimed injuries until after his termination. So this is a post-termination filing of a specific injury claim. And if you're familiar with Labor Code 3600, you know that the reason that this claim is, is denied is probably because the employee blew the statute of limitations timeline of the 30-day statute for reporting a specific incident of injury. And the statute, as you know, is much, much different for allegations involving cumulative trauma, but we don't get from this cover letter that there's any allegation of cumulative trauma. It tells us here that this is a claim for a specific incident of injury filed after termination. So this allows us to very narrowly focus our evaluation on the issues in dispute, which simply involves two things really, and that is, does the examinee have a bona fide diagnosable symptomatic condition of the left shoulder? That's number one. Is there a condition with the left shoulder? And that tells you about the extent of your physical examination procedures required. And then number two, is it possible or is it reasonably medically probable that that condition, that shoulder condition could have been contributed to by the workplace duties of lifting heavy rocks the way that the examinee or the applicant described it to have occurred, okay? So a very specific uh, and targeted and focused physical examination and a very targeted and focused face-to-face -face evaluation simply to resolve the disputed issue of AOE and COE, okay? So let's now take a look at another uh, cover letter this one here from the claims administrator, and many of you will recognize uh, this form cover letter. It's from one of the large insurers here in the state of California. And again, it gives us very little information except for here in the second paragraph. It tells us that you're being ex asked to examine Mrs. Smith because there exists a dispute with the findings of the primary treating physician's determination regarding the following. And here it tells us that the disputes involve permanent stationary status, extent and scope of medical treatment, <coughs> the employee's preclusion or likely preclusion from engaging in his usual occupation, and the level of permanent disability. And this sounds a whole lot like disputes that are resolved under Labor Code 4061. 4061. And these are the bullet point disputes specifically described under Labor Code 4061. So what do we now know, knowing that this evaluation is ordered under Labor Code 46, 4061? We know that 4060 issues, compensability issues, causation issues, AOE, COE issues, are not in dispute. They've already been resolved. This is a, a, an accepted claim for which the examinee has received treatment from the primary treating physician. I, I blacked out the date of injury up here, but here it tells us that the date of injury was October 21, 2020. So this is a date of injury uh, approximately 15 months ago, 15 months from the date of the evaluation. So this tells us that this is an examinee who's gone through medical treatment, has received medical treatment, the primary treating physician has rendered some opinions and conclusions on permanent stationary, the level of permanent disability, and one or the other of the parties, whether it be the injured employee himself or the claims administrator, is disputing some of the primary treating physician's determinations and is bringing this evaluation to us for a qualified medical evaluation. They continue and they tell us with just a little bit of background information that the employee sustained an injury to the lower back area. Okay, so this tells us the body part involved with the evaluation. It's a very specific, targeted, and single body part region. It happened over 15 months ago. 
and it happened while he was shooting a gun at work on the shooting range. Shooting a gun at work on the shooting range. So again, like the shoulder case before this, this tells us about the potential types of injuries that could be, uh, that could involve the lower back uh, with this mechanism of injury. In other words, again, it's not gonna be a fracture injury, it's not gonna be a crush injury, it's not a slip and fall injury, it's likely a, a jarring, a, a small jarring type of an injury to the lumbar spine. Uh, the injured worker lost time from such and such to such and such, and then again, such and such through such and such through uh, 2021, and he's also retired. So what do we get from this? We get that this injured worker has had some lost time from work in the weeks and months and maybe even days preceding the date of the retirement. How convenient and coincidental is that? So what does that tell us about the scope of our evaluation? In this evaluation, are we gonna to need to discuss issues related to AOE, COE? No, we don't need to spend any time involved with that. So in knowing the labor codes involved with the evaluation and in knowing the disputed issues driving the need for your evaluation, let's take a look now and how knowing this fa these facts can help us streamline and target our face-to-face -face evaluation. Okay, so here we have a chart that depicts the three labor codes that drive the needs for our evaluations. And this chart is not a complete chart. This is just a sample car chart. The number of issues involved in your evaluation may be greater or lesser than that which is de depicted in this particular chart. But this is just a sample chart to give you some ideas as to how you can uh, direct your thinking and direct your approaches during the face-to-face -face evaluation with your very next injured worker. So let's say that you determine that the evaluation has been ordered under Labor Code 4060, and you know, therefore, that the issue in dispute, the issue driving the need for your evaluation is industrial causation, AOE, COE. And in the example that uh, I showed you in the cover letter, the body part involved with that evaluation is simply one body part, which is the left shoulder. So knowing this information, what does that tell us about the focus of our history and interview with the examinee in the face-to-face -face evaluation? Well, some of the issues, and this is not a complete list, again, this is just a sample, but it's a representative sample of where you want to take the interview uh, with your injured worker. So number one, you wanna focus on the mechanism of the injury and learn about how the examinee claims to have suffered injury to the left shoulder. Now in our sample cover letter, the mechanism of injury is described as lifting heavy rocks. So this is where you would wanna explore how it was that the heavy lifting rocks uh, resulted in an injury to the left shoulder. And you would wanna get many, many details regarding the mechanism of injury so that later on, when it comes time for you to provide your opinion on AOE, COE, you have the details necessary to support an opinion either for or against industrial injury. Now, in this particular example, the cover letter told us that the employee did not report the injury until after his separation from the employer. So a good line of questioning that you might want to uh, pursue to determine the veracity and the authenticity of this actual unreported incident of injury is to pursue a line of questioning regarding his reporting of the injury. Why did he not report it? When did he report it? Did he report it, but it simply didn't get documented? In other words, this is critical information upon which later on in your report, you're gonna rely when it comes time for you to provide your opinion on AOE, COE. What about your examination procedures? Well, with an AOE, COE determination, the purpose of the physical examination is simply to, to do two things. Number one is to determine the presence or absence of a condition, 
a diagnosable symptomatic condition of the left shoulder, okay, this is not a permanent impairment evaluation where you have to assess for the presence or absence of impairments, but rather you simply have to determine the presence or absence of a bona fide condition of the left shoulder. So this involves a very streamlined physical examination. Your physical examination need only be sufficient to determine the presence or absence of a condition. When you determine the presence or absence of a condition, you then are obligated to make an opinion as to whether or not that condition could be related to the workplace duties, but the examination procedure examination procedure can be shortened significantly to the extent that it identifies the presence or absence of a bona fide diagnosable condition. So this is a very streamlined and focused and targeted evaluation, the purpose of which is to resolve the disputed issue, which is only one issue, industrial causation under Labor Code 4060. Now the second example in our second cover letter was an evaluation that we determined was ordered under Labor Code 4061, which deals with several different types of issues, such as the existence or extent of permanent impairment. In other words, does the examinee have permanent impairment? Is there the existence of permanent impairment? And if so, what is the extent of that permanent impairment? Perhaps the primary treating physician reported a 2% permanent impairment for the lower back and the injured worker is disputing that, stating that it's too low. Or perhaps the claims administrator is claiming that, is disputing that and claiming that the examinee has no permanent impairment of the lumbar spine, okay? So that's the permanent impairment dispute. Uh, any limitations that they might have are under dispute. The need for future medical care might be an issue uh, that is under dispute and the body parts that are involved with the injury may be an issue that's in dispute as well. And all of these disputes are handled under Labor Code 4061. So when you get an evaluation under Labor Code 4061, now the focus of your history changes not to issues related with AOE COE, but rather issues related to the extent and existence of impairment. So some of the issues that you're gonna to wanna to explore are the treatment to date. Treatment to date, Mr. Jones, tell me about the treatment that you've received so far. And knowing the treatment to date, you may then conclude that the examinee is not permanent and stationary and needs an additional modality or type of treatment. Or you may conclude that the, that the examinee actually is permanent and stationary and has exhausted all forms of medical treatment to cure or relieve the condition and can reasonably be considered permanent and stationary. If the examinee is current and permanent and stationary, you're going to want to pursue the current symptoms. You're going to want to do a good activities of daily living assessment so that you can properly support your <coughs> numeric permanent impairment rating, whatever that may be. And then you'll also want to explore the relevant medical history in case of the situation where you do provide a permanent impairment rating for the examinee, then of course we're always obligated to discuss apportionment of that permanent impairment. And that's when you're going to wish you had many, many details regarding the examinee's relevant medical history. So this is not a complete list, but it gives you some idea as to how you can target your face-to-face -face interview with the examinee. And then in the examination, the purpose of the examination is to determine the presence or absence of impairments, in this case, of the lower back. So your physical examination procedure is not simply to determine the presence or absence of a condition, as in the Labor Code 4060 evaluation, rather, we now know that the examinee has had a bona fide condition of the lumbar spine, he's received treatment for the lumbar spine, and now we're concerned about any residual effects, any residual losses, also known as impairments of the lumbar spine. So here is where your physical examination is gonna to have to be more precise, more detailed. Your range of motion measurements are gonna to have to be done in exact accordance with the AMA guides. And this is a much more, uh, a detailed physical examination than is required under the Labor Code 4060 
evaluation. Finally, even though we don't have an example cover letter uh, or a sample case, uh, we can simply say that when the evaluation is ordered under Labor Code 4062, this deals with other disputes and objections uh, not covered under Labor Code 4060 or 4061, such as the diagnosis, such as the apportionment of the permanent impairment, such as the work restrictions, and depending upon what you determine to be the issue and dispute, will determine the focus of your history and interview in the face-to-face -face interview, and will also determine the examination procedures that you're going to employ. If, for example, the dispute is under the apportionment section of the permanent impairment, then you know that your evaluation is going to be involved in number one, determining the impairments. Again, you'll be, you'll be required and asked to assess the examinee for the presence or absence of impairments. And then also with sufficient details from the relevant medical history and knowing the examinee's current symptoms, you can then provide a substantial opinion on the apportionment of any of that permanent impairment that you may discover in your evaluation. So doctors, knowing these labor codes and knowing the uh, particular labor code that drives the need for your evaluation is critical for you to be able to streamline and focus your evaluation specifically down, down, down to the issue in dispute so that you can be very, very time efficient and very, very effective in the face-to-face -face evaluation so that you can get the job done quickly, accurately, and efficiently. And let's just conclude today's session by saying that part of being a QME forensic super sleuth begins, begins with understanding the agendas of the parties. And the agendas of the parties itself begins by understanding the labor codes that are driving the need for your evaluation. And uh, I wonder of you, how many of you are old enough to remember uh, Detective Colombo? Do you remember Detective uh, Colombo played by actor Peter Falk? If you remember Detective Colombo, he was always famous for deep introspection and then coming up with just the perfect question that would help him solve the case. And what Detective Columbo was famous for was uh, he was famous for understanding <coughs> the needs of the parties. He was expert in understanding the agenda uh, of the suspects. And once he could understand and get a handle on the agenda of the suspects, he knew the particular line of questioning to pursue that would help him solve the mystery. Now, this is much different than being given all the information up front. If uh, Detective Colombo was given all the information that he needed to solve the mystery up front, <laughs> there would be no need for his skill and expertise in uh, his private investigations. And similarly for us as qualified medical evaluators, if we were given all the information that we would uh, rely upon for the formulation of our opinions and conclusions, this job would be so much easier and we could do such a, a much better job at it. However, because the parties don't tell us their agendas, they don't tell us their needs, it becomes very, very difficult for us to do an adequate job. And this is what raises the needs for supplemental reports, reevaluations, and even depositions as the parties try and bring us in together all on the same page to help resolve what could have been originally resolved much simpler and much sooner had we just been given the appropriate information. So part of being a QME forensic super sleuth is in understanding the agendas of the parties and understanding the needs of the parties. And that begins by understanding which labor code is driving the need for the evaluation. Okay? So in our next session, we're going to go into uh, more detail about labor codes 4060, 4061, and 4062 to help you uh, determine the exact direction that your evaluation needs to take once you determine which labor code is actually driving the evaluation. 
So I want to thank you for being with me on today's discussion. I look forward to being with you on our next discussion as well as we continue our current program entitled The QME Forensic Super Sleuth. For now, this is Dr. Perry Carpenter. I'm wishing you best of success in your career as a qualified medical evaluator.